Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Amy Zwecka and I am here to talk to you about gaze control. Um, this is the first in a series of shorter lectures that will address this issue. My objectives today are to focus on um, the, the, a small area of gaze control. As you can see, this is a very complicated system that involves the brain, the cerebellum, the brainstem structures of nuclei and nerves. Um, but what I'm going to focus on today in particular are the extraocular muscles and the nerves. So our objectives are to discuss the eye muscles involved in ocular motility, to discuss the innervation of the ocular muscles, to route the course of cranial nerves from the brainstem to the eye muscles, and to describe lesions that occur when the nerve is injured. Here is a, an illustration of the muscles that are, in, that are attaching to the eyeball. As you can see, there are six muscles, the lateral rectus, the medial rectus, the superior rectus, the inferior, I'm sorry, the inferior rectus, the inferior oblique, and the superior oblique. And each of these muscles has a unique uh, function. So the superior rectus, uh, this, this, is a, this is a schematic of uh, the eye muscle movement. And so this is the representation for the right eye. And so as you can see, the lateral rectus tends to pull objects to the right. The medial rectus moves it to the left or medially. The superior rectus elevates the eye when the eye is in abduction, and the inferior rectus depresses the eye when the eye is in abduction. Uh, in adduction, though, it is the inferior oblique that elevates the eye and the superior oblique that depresses the eye. There are three nerves that supply these muscles. The abduction's nerve, or the sixth nerve, supplies the lateral rectus. The trochlear nerve, or the fourth nerve, supplies the superior oblique. And the oculomotor nerve, or the third nerve, uh, does the remainder, which includes the superior rectus, the inferior oblique, the medial rectus, and the inferior rectus. And it also does supply the levator palpebrae and the pupil. This is our first case. You can see when uh, the patient AB attempts to abduct the right eye. It does not go all the way over. It does not pass midline. I'll show you that one more time. Vision to the left is completely full, but when the eyes are brought over to the right, the eye does not cross midline. So the eye does not fully abduct. In this situation, the lesion is in, in the abduction's nerve, or the sixth nerve. The sixth nerve, as we discussed, is responsible for abducting an eye. The, the, the structures involved in abduction, uh, the signal begins in the nucleus, which is located in the pons, uh, in the dorsal pons, right up next to the fourth ventricle. This, uh, that's what's represented right here. The fascicle of the sixth nerve exits ventrally and travels through the brainstem next to the corticospinal tracts and exits uh, ventrally. The sixth nerve nucleus is intimately associated with the seventh nerve fascicle. This is the seventh nerve nucleus. And you can see that the fascicle wraps around the sixth nerve nucleus. The abduction's nerve, after it leaves the um, brainstem ventrally, travels superiorly across the clivus, takes a 90 degree turn at the petrocolinoid ligament, travels through the cavernous sinus, and then into the orbit where it goes to supply the lateral rectus muscle. When there is a lesion of the abduction's nerve, it causes horizontal binocular diplopia that is worse when looking towards the side of the lesion. So if you have a right sixth nerve palsy, it will cause a right abduction deficit where the double vision will be worse when looking to the right. The sixth nerve is a commonly injured nerve. 
because of its close contact with the meninges and the edge of the tentorium, and that makes it more susceptible to meningeal processes and being stretched in situations of increased intracranial pressure. Here is our second case. This patient looking straight ahead has a little bit of ptosis on the right. There is some limited AB adduction when looking to the left, some limited elevation, but abduction is completely full in the right eye. When the eyelids are opened, there is a limitation of depression as well. On pupil examination, there is anisocoria with the right pupil larger than the left and minimal reaction. The source of this lesion is a third nerve nuclei, third nerve lesion. The oculomotor nerve, or the third nerve, supplies the superior rectus, the inferior oblique, the inferior rectus, and the medial rectus. So when there is dysfunction of the third nerve, there is limitation of elevation, depression, and adduction in particular. Because it also supplies the lateral, uh, the um, levator palpebrae and the pupil, there is often medriasis causing anisocoria and decreased uh, reaction to light as well as atosis. This patient does not have a full third nerve palsy, rather she has a partial third nerve palsy because there is still function left of her eye muscles. The ocular motor nerve has a nucleus that exists, uh, again, dorsally close to the aqueduct of the third ventricle. The fascicle exits ventrally and travels through the brainstem right next to the red nucleus and the cerebral peduncle, exits in the interpeduncular cistern, and travels uh, through the subarachnoid space to the cavernous sinus, and then into the orbit. When a patient has a third nerve palsy, they will have weakness of elevation because of effect of the superior rectus and the inferior oblique, depression due to uh, the inferior rectus weakness, and AB, adduction due to the medial rectus weakness. They may have medriasis or loss of pupil constriction, and they may have ptosis. Often this will be described as a down and out lesion, which is illustrated here. A third nerve palsy uh, can occur from multiple different etiologies. In particular, compression is a common cause. Uh, the most concerning cause of a compressive third nerve palsy is an aneurysm compression. This is an important sign to recognize as this may be the only hint that there might be an aneurysm enlarging in the intracranial space. The oculomotor nucleus is a unique structure because it is actually a collection of a multitude of smaller nuclei that comes together to create the third nerve fascicle. As you can see on, this is midline, and these are all different nuclei. Uh, the unique components are that there is only one levator palpebrae nucleus that supplies both sides, and the superior rectus nucleus actually supplies the contralateral side. It is the only crossing nucleus of this complex. And the reason why this is significant is because if there is a unilateral third nucleus lesion or oculomotor nucleus lesion, it will cause bilateral ptosis because of the damage to the single levator palpebrae nucleus. And it will cause bilateral ptosis due to damage of the fascicle that is crossing from the other side, but also damage to the nucleus that is supplying the contralateral side. So again, if there is a lesion of a unilateral oculomotor nucleus, the patient will have bilateral ptosis and bilateral upgaze palsy in addition to the unilateral uh, weakness with um, elevation, depression, and adduction with pupil involvement. 
The trochlear nerve is uh, only supplies the superior oblique. The superior oblique is responsible for uh, depressing the eye in adduction. It is a difficult lesion to see on um, eye movement examination alone and often requires um, provocative maneuvers. Lesion of the trochlear nerve causes an oblique or vertical diplopia. Patients will notice that the vision is worse when they are looking down and in towards the nose. It causes an ipsilateral hypertropia where the affected eye is higher on the side on the affected side than on the normal side. This hypertropia will be worse when they are looking towards the nose or towards the opposite side and when the head is tilting to the same side. And these patients will often have a resting contralateral head tilt to compensate for the dysfunction of the trochlear nerve. This nerve is most often affected by trauma. Um, it is also frequently um, a congenital, there's frequently congenital weakness of this nerve that people are well compensated for until later in life. So this can occasionally present later in life as a decompensation. A microvascular process can also injure this nerve. The trochlear nerve lives in the dorsal midbrain. It, the fascicle exits immediately, crosses to the other side, and wraps around the midbrain. After it wraps around the midbrain, it travels through the subarachnoid space and into the cavernous sinus. At that point, it, cat, it moves into the orbital apex to supply the superior oblique muscle. So when patients have a lesion of the superior oblique muscle, they will have weakness that is evident when looking down and towards the nose. So the easiest um, picture to see that in is actually this one. So the patient has a lesion of the right fourth nerve nucleus. You can see that the right eye is a little bit higher than the left in the initial picture. You can actually also see that there is a slight left head tilt um, even in the picture. But when the patient looks down and down uh, towards the nose of the affected side, so down and in towards the on the affected side, the eye does not completely depress. So in adduction, the affected eye does not completely depress. However, when looking to the right side, it is completely improved, and there's a, a uh, there is symmetric function. Is a very subtle finding, finding, and sometimes you have to actually do what's called a cross cover examination to really see the defect. So what cross cover does is removes binocular fixation, and you can actually see the corrective saccade that occurs due to the weakness of the muscle. So basically, what happens is that when you cover each eye, the patient has to refixate, and so they're yoked and both eyes go down, both guys, eyes go up, um, and that is due to weakness of the fourth nerve. That is it for this particular lecture. Uh, please see my next lecture for further discussion of gaze.